60 years after the time in the killing skies over Germany, the bomber boys can still taste the fear of battle. We were nervous, naturally, everyone was. You might as well say you're scared. But all this sparkly stuff ahead of you was flak. It was bursting shells. If you got hit while your bombs are still on board, well, that could be a bit dramatic. The sweat was just pouring off because you knew you were gonna die. The night bombing of the Third Reich by Allied air crews was a crucial factor in winning the Second World War. Fighters may have been Britain's salvation, but bombers were the means to victory. Phil Gray was a Lancaster pilot who flew 30 operations before he turned 22. You see, I'd heard the stories of World War I, the horror stories. That's why I decided to join Bomber Command. I didn't fancy shooting someone down at 20 feet away. Our uh, wireless operator reckoned that was a very civilized way to go to war. We asked him to explain that, and he said, well, from 20,000 feet, can you hear the screams down below? I said, no. He says, if we get hit, can they hear us screaming? Reg Patterson was 23 when his Lancaster exploded beneath him. She came down in a wild spin there. And fortunately for me, the, the roof was cracked and by the flak and everything. It was all shattered kind of thing. So I had a seat pack on, and I just pulled my safety harness, and I ran my head up through the roof and batted away there and wiggled my way out, and away I went. And Joe English was two years out of high school when he first went into battle. You know, you did see other guys go down, and, and you'd see somebody go down here and over there and up here, and uh, it was scary. 125,000 aircrew fought Bomber Command's war. Almost half, 56,000, were killed. Their average age was 22. And many began their journey in cold water barracks just like this. Does everyone know the parts of the Tiger Moth? Have you looked at that diagram? 6 a.m. The recruits of Baker Flight begin another day of being steeped in the culture of combat. These seven young men have come to Canada to undergo the air crew training their grandfathers once did. Everyone's belts are on properly facing the right way. A training that has been harder than they'd ever imagined. My tie, okay? Make sure yours is a little centered. Guys, check ties. Ties. If they stick it out, good, good. the boys will honor their families and prove to their granddads that they too may have what it takes. Yeah, you're central. See you guys. Oh. Gentlemen, Sergeant Williams assures me that you will pass my inspection this morning. You made a liar out of him once, don't make a liar out of him twice. He will be exceedingly angry with you if you fail this inspection today. Mr. Hillman, you've mastered the razor, have you? Yes, sir. Tied to the sparrows behind, sir. Very good. Good turnout. Thank you, sir. Hello. Did you just come out of the shower and forgot to dry yourself? No, sir. I just sweat, sweat a lot, sir. Are you nervous? Yes, sir. Why are you nervous? I just always get nervous, sir. And a, a competent air craftsman who's done his job well would not be nervous like that. Yes, sir. You got to tuck that bloody hair back. Fix it now. Straighten out your tie. Tighten it up. Everything was going exceedingly well up until now. You've kind of let the flight down a bit. Your turnout is not quite as up to snuff. Don't move your head. Did I tell you to move your head? No, sir. Right. I have knees and I can bend them. I don't need your assistance in inspecting airmen. Your boots have improved dramatically. Good turnout, Mark. Gentlemen, you did not make a liar out of Sergeant Williams. Your kit has progressed by leaps and bounds. 
compared to my first full inspection. There are a few minor things for you to continue to work on, and there will be an inspection tonight at 21.30 to make sure we clean up the last bits. That's aimed at you, Mr. Lowe. Yes, sir. You other gentlemen will make sure that his bed space and kit is properly laid out at 21.30 tonight. Carry on, Flight Senior. Sir. Great job, guys. Just great job. That's right, like that. Is that part of the part? We're all going to help just keep tonight, it, man. Just keep it the way it is until tonight. Shit, this is not good. This is oh, this is just, just oh, it's too much, isn't it? it, it it's amazing yes. to hear it come from yeah. him. When you take your aircraft into combat, you don't want to think about your rudder, your elevator, and your ailerons. That's the instinct. Second World War air crew training lasted about two years. Almost every recruit was a high school graduate and subjects who were taught at a university level. But when we have a high pressure system underneath the wing, a low pressure system on top of the wing, and we deflect that aileron into that airflow. Early in the war, the Allies needed pilots. Germany had long prepared for the air war, and their crews were veterans. But few Allied instructors had ever seen combat. They knew the theory, but not the practice of war. Canada was turning out pilots like, uh, like sausages. They had more pilots than they knew what to do with. If you wanted to be brutal about it, the RAF couldn't kill them all fast enough. Philip Gray came to Canada from a village in Scotland to learn how to fly. I was a little country lad and being strapped into a Lancaster for the first time, I couldn't believe, you know, a few years before I'd been running around with skin knees and ripped pants trying to catch rabbits and suddenly here I was sitting in this Lancaster. Philip graduated at the top of his class, but nothing he'd learned prepared him for the terror of facing death. When you're 21, you know nothing it can't happen to you. It happens to the other guy, but oh yes it can. But we're always, we're always a bit arrogant at 21, aren't we? Sure, it can't happen to us, but oh yes it can. Big flights, left turn. The average age of Baker flight is also 21. And like the recruits Philip Gray trained with, they're a confident flight. Phil completed his tour and returned to his Highland home, only to find that he was the sole survivor of the seven village boys who went to war. What a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Yeah, you can step on the seat too if you want to see me down there. So, your controls are just like you have in the aircraft. Pull back towards you, push forward, that's going to put you down. Rolling left and right is controlled. That's right. Only the top third of each class became pilots. The rest were dropped from the pilot stream, usually here, at the Link trainer. The Link was one of the first flight simulators. Over 10,000 were used during the war to teach recruits the basics of flying. With the pedals on the floor? Yeah, there you go. Daniel Crow is a computer technician from South Australia. Well, I've played a lot of computer games and even this was exciting for me. Um, working in three dimensions when you're actually moving with it, it's completely different to working in three dimensions when you're using a J key to, to go up and, or a K to go down. About 10 degrees to starboard. Oh, in a computer game, you can just get up and start a new game. In this, you actually feel like, oh, I'm tipping over. So it's a, it's a lot more real. OK, get ready for landing. Wheels down. That's it, right there. You get a great feeling of satisfaction when you are flying straight and level because you, you just feel steady and you're going straight. And then uh, and it's, when I did that 180 degree turn, I, I surprised myself and uh, did a few more after that and it was just great. Dan is the only member of Baker Flight who was married. I love you.
this is uh, what I tend to spend or what I tend to spend most of my time on the computer doing. Playing Rocket Arena 3 on the internet. At 26, he'd have been almost too old for training in 1942. Why? Twelve thousand Australians came to Canada, hoping to become pilots. One of them was Dan's grandfather, Les Kemp. My granddad Les talks about the war a lot. Uh, he doesn't talk specifically about the training and stuff he did, but uh, I, I found it very interesting to um, get an idea of what the sort of training was that they went through and. Um, the weather conditions and how physically stressful and emotionally stressful it was. Les washed out on the link, but served as a navigator on a Halifax. The Australians left a colourful mark on the small Canadian towns where they trained. Called our noisy cousins, they were quick to point out that they were fighting not for Britain, but for their mates. I asked uh, my granddad what the people around him were, were feeling at the time, and he said they were, they were all scared stiff, more of uh, letting their mates down and their buddies down than for their own lives. The Australians fought a long and distinguished war. Bomber Command's most active unit was Australia's 460 Squadron that also suffered the highest death rate. Four six zero took so many casualties, their entire contingent of flight crews had to be replaced five times. Today was one of the most amazing days of my life. Actually, we had an excellent day. It was just amazing. It was absolutely fantastic. It was uh, well too short. Well, what an experience that was, let me tell you. Definitely <laughs> the better of all the days that we've been here. It was so worth it. Every, every minute of it has been just worth it. We're here somewhere. Bigger flight. Halt. Here are a few of my favorite things. There's a uh, flight cap and the gloves. Uh, here's my trusty goggles. Air Force recruits signed up to fly, not march. And after tedious hours of drill squares and classrooms, Baker Flight is about to do what every bomber boy longed to do, go flying. The Tiger Moth was the first aircraft most recruits got their hands on. Rugged and forgiving, they were a common sight over Canada in the 1940s. Almost 10,000 were used in wartime training. The recruits of Baker Flight are a more worldly generation than their grandfathers were. Yet even they can't disguise the excitement at slipping the Earth's surly bond. Today was especially great because we got to fly in the de Havilland Tiger Moth. That was the first of the seven boys to fly. <gasps> Matthew English is the grandson of a Lancaster pilot who also learned to fly on a Tiger Moth. They start you off just to see if you can follow the controls, you know, uh, flying straight and level, taking a couple of very simple little turns. That would be probably your first lesson. And then they went on and on from there to cross countries. You had to do pilot navigation to maybe uh, three points on the compass, you know. The Tiger Moth can get off the ground in uh, 75 to 100 feet easy. Just that thing lifts off the ground so fast. 
we did get to fly when we were up there. The first time I ever flew a plane, the first time I've ever been in an open cockpit plane before. The flying was fun though, but you had to concentrate, you know, to pass uh, the instructor's tests. You, you joined the Air Force to be a pilot, you know? I, I, I got lucky. It was almost scary um, taking control of the plane. It's great. You, you can definitely get the yaw going. You'll be flying sideways for a while there, back and forth. and It's just a hoot, and it goes fast while you're up there. just great. You can see everything, just absolutely everything. Oh, great experience. Glorious, breathtaking, like a hawk in the morning sky. These were some of the remarks in letters written home by wartime trainees after their first flight. John Ross of Australia said that he felt like a hunter. An Englishman, Alan Park, wrote of the lightness of spirit and pure joy of being that he felt as he flew the Canadian skies. That was amazing. Oh, wow. I think I'm going to get my pilot license. I love that. Tiger Moth training was the first step on the way to the air war that awaited them. But the recruits weren't thinking of tomorrow. They were having too much fun today. Tiger Moths, Harvards, Avro Ansons. Recruits moved from aircraft to aircraft as their confidence grew. But hanging over the Esprit de Corps was the constant shadow that something might go wrong. The loss rate under training was, was, was high, as it always is, because at some point when students have to go solo, they may not get things right. The station diaries and scrapbooks are full of photographs of funerals and the funerals for, uh, around stations were publicly attended and there are flying training casualty graves all over the country. Baker Flight's training is taking place at an original World War II base in southern Ontario. The camp has been closed for years, but the rooms still resonate with a camaraderie of brothers in arms. Outside the gates, a flight of graves, seven. Air crew recruits killed in training, perhaps on a summer's day just like this. You see the faces of your friends come before you, you know. And you say to yourself, how fortunate I am. I've had 60 years of living. How fortunate I am that I was able to become a priest and serve the people of God. David Petrie was 19 when he volunteered for the Air Force. An exceptional student, David went to university at 15 and graduated with a gold medal in science four years later. David died in a flying accident, along with eight others, when their training aircraft collided. Harry Schmuck was also 19 when he went to war. One day on a training flight, all four engines on his Halifax simply stopped. I don't think I thought of anything except, I gotta get out of this turret 
and I gotta get my chute on, I have to crawl 30 feet, I have to open the escape hatch, and then bail out, you know. <laughs> and we're in a power dive where I can't even lift my arm, you know. Harry, who became a priest after the war, can never forget the terror of falling from the sky. And here you were now, you're gonna die. And I couldn't move, I couldn't move a muscle. You talk about sweating, you know, it's 20 below zero, whatever it was, you know. Uh, the sweat was just pouring off you, you know, and, and because you knew you were gonna die. I don't think there's many guys that I know that wanted to die at 19 or 20 years old, you know. You, uh, you're, in, you're full of life and you want to live life to the, the ultimate, you know. Almost a thousand recruits from a dozen countries lie in Canadian graveyards. Most were killed in flying accidents. At David Petrie's funeral, the eulogy read, brilliant through life, honored at death, treasured in memory, one of the best. Robin Hillman is the quiet one of Baker Flight. Out here, you know, they, they take all your uh, civilian stuff away. You're, uh, you're a new person, really. You're starting from scratch, and all you've got are your, your comrades here. And, that's, uh, and you sort of have to rely on them uh, and lean on them to, uh, to make it through everything. Are you recording now? Yeah. <laughs> Robin's parents ran a Chinese restaurant on the Canadian prairies, and he was raised in a mix of cultures. Good job. Good for you. <laughs> well, in case you haven't got it by now, I'm sort of a geek. I'm into comic books and science fiction. I uh, did my major in computer science. So uh, that's sort of who I am. I play video games and, uh, yeah, pretty much a geek. Robin lost four great uncles in Bomber Command. His grandmother's brother, William Campbell, was a Lancaster pilot, killed in training days before the end of the war. It devastated my family because uh, the war was over, and uh, to have uh, your brother killed uh, right when the war is over, it just devastated uh, my grandmother, I think. Regret to inform you began the telegram that broke the heart of Robin's family. William Campbell died in a fiery crash, along with his entire crew, one of whom was Ed Wright, the rear gunner. Edward was just 16. All right, and these are the what? Uh, that's the front sight, correct? And the rear sight. Like started. war is real, it's... Uh... All it's right. not just like in the movies, going off and it's fine. It's fine. shooting people and you come back home alive. It's, you could die out there. I think a lot of the people back then had uh, a lot more pride for their country and uh, really thought that they were fighting for freedom. Nowadays, uh, people aren't so sure if, uh, if that's what they're fighting for. Dots and dashes, dits and daws, Morse code was the information lifeline of the Second World War. All recruits were taught the basics of signaling, but only those who became wireless operators actually knew what to listen for. The trick is to hear the spaces, not the letters. And to, to start this, uh, let's go through it and have you repeat those, the letters as I send them. Dave Christie has been brought in to teach Baker Flight how to signal. Part technician, part code breaker, wireless operators were also trained as gunners. 
It took longer to train a wireless operator than it did a pilot. For a wireless for a gunner, he had to do bombing gunnery. He had to do uh, a little bit of, of navigation. Uh, the, the wireless course itself was 24 weeks. So he did other things as well. And that's necessary because certainly in the early aircraft, they had uh, pretty small crews. And that meant that every live warm body they took with them had to be able to do more than one job. And that's why you have someone who's a wireless air gunner. I got a couple. What was the second one? Feet. Second. I don't know where I got that R before it, but I got <laughs> so At least I got the eat part. So. Reet. I uh, got them all and got the spacing this time. I think if you sat down and just went through the alphabet, just like um, sort of recognizing the, the, the timing and the spacing of it, I reckon that'd be quite interesting to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, once you get good at it, I mean, well, it's like, like it's like I suppose it's like a musical instrument. Like once you can play like a guitar fluently, it's like yeah. it's it's so it's nice, and, and it's second nature. You know, you yeah. you got to get it into your subconscious. It doesn't yeah. even think about it even more. Oh just no, I bet yeah, the letters it, just, it just flows like music. To him. Thumb and uh, and second finger on either side of the key, index finger on the center. That's about all it needs. It's an instrument. You're playing it. That's the sense that you need to have about, about when, you're, when you're manipulating a key. These recruits are more familiar with keyboards than keypads. But getting their hands on their grandfather's technology shows how far we've come in the space of a lifetime. That's right. What we're doing is getting you to drag out that dash a little bit longer. One of the things I used to carry on the bombers was uh, a carrier pigeon. And if you went down in the channel, what you would do is uh, you would put the note on the carrier pigeons uh, in a little, little message uh, container and you would release him and you'd sit in your dinghy and wait for uh, Air Sea Rescue to come and get you. At the start of the war, targets were found by dead reckoning or by luck. Four years later, when Joe English flew his Lank into battle, the era of the high-tech war had begun. The airways were flooded with false signals and electronic noise. It was up to Joe's wireless operator, Mike Chalk, to filter them out. All the wireless operators were RAF guys, and so they had to fly with Canadians, and, and uh, we got a hold of Mike. I don't think he ever made a mistake on receiving Morse code, and, and he was just always, always a good guy to be with. Mike was a colorful character who claimed he hit the jackpot when he married a woman who owned a pub. And he says, why not? He says, I spent the first half of my life on one side of the bar. I'm going to spend the last half of my wife on the other side of the bar. <laughs> and that was Mike. <laughs> Mike is now 80 and suffers from Alzheimer's. The crew heard a rumor that he was ailing, but no one has seen Mike since the war. He was excellent, yeah. Never questioned Mike about his job. He, uh, we just expected and we knew that he was an excellent you know, wireless, wireless operator. Baker Flight has had another long day, but they've enough energy for gossip about the girls they've left behind. Stacy's helping me shine my boots. She's a sweetie. She's a good girl. Yeah, she's all right. She's got the most fantastic pair of tits ever. She's cute. Oh, yeah, you bet she's cute. Better write to Oh, no. I grabbed a receipt instead of her address. <laughs> She's going to be mad at me at the moment, so mad because I haven't been in contact or anything. I'm going to try and write a letter over the next couple of days, explain my situation. Because she's probably uh, thinking that I'm in Canada with some other lady, I would imagine. But this is so far from the truth. Good luck getting back to her. <laughs> Better get back to her. Matthew English is one year out of high school. He's homesick and his heart is aching. The reason? A girl called Virgilia. Virgilia, I love you. I love you so much. 
and I can't wait to see you and just think about you every night. Yeah. When Matthew's granddad went to war, he too left a girl behind. Her name was Claire. I met Claire uh, kind of on a fluke. I hadn't met many girls at all, so I took my sister to this dance. But I was told to look for a cute little red-haired girl who was going to be at the dance. Joe and Claire only met twice. But like Matthew, 60 years later, Joe was smitten. I asked my sister to ask her friend who told me about Claire to, um, could I write to her? And it was a, strictly a, a, a romance of that type. You know, it was all letters back and forth. Wartime romances are as fragile as a Canadian spring. Claire came to Joe's graduation and said she'd write. They promised to meet again, but like many wartime lovers, they didn't know where, didn't know when. climbing on top of your barracks tonight and jumping off and landing on the ground. All right, there is a proper way to land. All right, obviously this is a very critical piece of equipment and hopefully you'll never have to use it uh, because it is the last ditch effort to save your own life. All right, what you do is you take this. Parachute training for flight crews was as basic as it got. Clip it on and jump, count to three and pull. In like that. There you go, see how that is? That's properly packed, like that. The line comes in here, the line comes in here, it connects to the uh, ripcord handle. You would not bail out with your helmet on because apparently someone had and the cord of the helmet got twisted around their neck and choked them. There you go. Only the pilot actually wore his chute. The rest of the crew hung theirs on hooks, tough to find in a dark, tumbling aircraft. The escape hatch gets opened up, and you throw yourself out into the big blue, right? One thing you want to make sure of is that you clear the aircraft, okay? Recruits did no practice jumps. The logic being, a burning aircraft was all the incentive needed to take that first leap. You put your hand on the parachute handle like that, your right hand and your left hand on top of it, so as you wouldn't accidentally pull it, and fall out and count a thousand and one, a thousand and two, a thousand and three, and then pull your whip cord. And prepare to roll. Roll. It is unpleasant. Crews were given even less instruction on how to escape if they landed behind enemy lines. Get up. The first thing you were to do, you uh, hid your parachute, and uh, then you started to walk west. And you could always tell what west was if it wasn't cloudy by the North Star. And uh, that was the only instructions we had. As the air war turned in favor of the Allies, Hitler began calling bomber crews terror flyers. Airmen who parachuted to safety were sometimes murdered by vengeful civilians. I always carried a, uh, a 38 with me. I didn't intend to fight the German army, but I thought that uh, with uh, if I were shot down and I met farmers in France who were collaborationists or people who wanted to turn me in but did not have any weapons, a revolver was better than a pitchfork because we also knew that they lynched airmen. If the Luftwaffe captured you, they sort of had a quid pro quo going on, you know, tit for tat. They treated our airmen well and we treated their airmen well. If you fell into the hands of the SS or the Gestapo, you were not treated as well and you might be killed right then and there or lynched. I was more worried about that than I was about dying in the air. Reg Patterson parachuted from a burning Lancaster and landed safely, or so he thought. I landed in a farmyard, I got a little pasture right up, just off the end of the barn. And I look up and 
I see this lady coming out of the barn with a pitchfork. I'm feeling around in all this rubble for my gun. And I finally pulled it out and sort of shook it at her. And she stopped, fortunately, because I don't know what I would have done if she hadn't. I don't think I would have shot her. But So I got up and ran the other way. And I met my engineer out in the middle of the field and guys in uniform coming. So I said, I think the uniform guys will be friendlier than the ones with the sticks, so let's go over there. So we did. No one knows how many died this way, but air crew veterans still speak of men they knew who were beaten, shot, or run through by pitchforks. Sixty years after it all began, the Joe English crew has reunited for a breakfast at dawn. Burke Thomas, the mid-upper gunner, is here, along with Harvey Gottfried, the navigator. Len Bowtree, who flew the Lucky H when Joe returned home, has shown up. And also Jack Mundy, the flight engineer, has come from England. Jack is the grandfather of Martin Harper, and like the others, He's keen to see how the boys have done. The recruits don't know it, but today's inspection will be one they will never forget. The instructors have warned them a VIP tour is coming, but they have no idea who. You, sir? I should be calling you, sir. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Girl. All right, gentlemen, why don't you come in and uh, we'll introduce you to Baker Flight. Oh, Follow right. me. Officer Joe English and his bomber crew from H for Howl, Lucky H. Gentlemen, I would like to invite you to inspect the uh, Baker flight and see if uh, they're up to the standards of your day. Please, by all means. And you can check their bed spaces and all of their shaving kits and uniforms as well. You will probably recognize a few faces in the crowd. Some of you might even look like you as well. Yes, sir, they're all underneath. Yes, they're sheep. Absolutely. Once you're satisfied with your uh, inspection, uh, flying officer, if you can have the crew just uh, hang back here. Exceptionally good. good for just a moment. Oh, good Good. <laughs> yes, you, right and you're from where? Oh, yeah. I'm from Brandon, Manitoba. I am. Uh, yes. Oh, I, I trained you. For Chris and Harvey, this is the moment of a lifetime. <laughs> Harvey's not been well, and Chris, the rebel recruit, was determined to make his granddad proud. Oh, just so pleased. <laughs> He's a great guy. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what. Yes, yeah, I'm still And Martin Harper, who nobody thought would stick it out, has shown his granddad that he too can take it. You want to miss this little experience? Oh, no, not now, no. Maybe the first day, yeah, I could, could have done without that first day. But, um, yeah. but no, not now. This is just, this is so good. This is so good. Yeah, I'm proud of it. 
to, to where the target is, he say, bombs away, and let a little dart go. Junker's 88? Yeah, Junker's 88, here, I'll get it. And, uh, the 87B, the 87B, that was, uh, yeah, the dive bomber. I think, I think I did every punishment that was, that was handed out, so, uh, for not quite shaving right, or the bed wasn't perfect, uh, the mirror wasn't clean. Beginning in 1940, graduations like these were held about once a month as recruits finished the first phase of training. Congratulations, Stevenson. Wear these with pride. Thank you, sir. Carry on. Some came for the adventure, others because their friends did. Air crew were all volunteers and every recruit could have been somewhere else. Baker Flight has worked hard to get this far, their graduation a symbol of respect for the men who came before. Beneath the warm gaze of their grandfathers, these seven young men can say, for one brief moment, they've marched in the shadows of that other generation who made it all possible. As any soldier will tell you, you can't have a graduation or a funeral without a party. The recruits and their granddads have been joined at the sergeant's mess by veterans from the local town. Throughout the long evening, the conversation flows like uncaked beer. Tales of honor, stories of sacrifice, and memories of long dead boys who sang songs of courage and glory, just like the bomber boys of Bakerfield. Next time on Bomber Boys, take off. Two generations, one journey. Oh, he's just living it up. The grandfathers bring the boys to the graveyards of Belgium, where Joe and Matthew discover the grave of a long lost family member. In Holland, the granddads are treated like celebrities. And the long overdue reunion brings memories and tears just weeks before a member of Joe's crew passes away. That's next time on Bomber Boys.